Good morning, my name is Pastor Dean Huber, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Winkler Berktoller Mennonite Church. We want to welcome you to our Good Friday service. It is a time when we reflect upon the death of Christ and the penalty that he paid on behalf of you and me. As believers in Christ, Good Friday is very important and a special day because the reason why Christ came was to die for you and me. He makes all the difference in the world when we walk with him now that he has forgiven us. Roman 5, 8 tells us, but God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We serve a God who pardons and sets us free from our sins, but it is only because God's son paid the price. Jesus will pardon us simply when we ask him to forgive our sins and to come into our lives and change us. Just one announcement this morning. This coming Sunday morning, we will be having an Easter worship service, and there are three platforms that you can watch from. The first is YouTube. Simply go to YouTube, YouTube and type in Winkler Berktaller Church, and the broadcast will come up. Secondly, you can go to our, web, uh, to our website, and that is at www.wbmc.ca. And then you can watch us also on cable TV channel 12 at, 12 at 10 a.m. in the morning on Sunday or on Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we want to thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that 2,000 years ago you sent your son into the world to die. It must have been a hard, hard, difficult road for him to go and for you to watch him pay the price for our sin. And the wrath fell upon him. And because he died in our place, you have pardoned us. Thank you, Lord, that you have sent your one and only son into this world and through him that we can have life in his name. I pray, Father, that you would go with us into this service. Have your hand upon everything that is said and done. And we pray too, Lord, for those who have lost loved ones. We pray right now for the Hebert family, for Dorothy and her family that lost Neil. We ask that your hand would be upon her. We pray also for all those suffering from the virus, that, the pandemic that is happening. We ask, Lord, that your hand would be upon those who are grieving at this time. There's many people who have lost loved ones. There's still others who are sick. And perhaps there are still others who are going to be coming sick. We ask, Lord, that you would have your hand upon each of those. Give them strength in this time. And Lord, may their hearts always turn towards you in their time of trouble. I pray, Father, now that you would go with us into the rest of the service. May you grant your favor. May we listen intently to the message. For this we pray in Christ's name. Hi, boys and girls. Today is Good Friday. It's the day when we remember how Jesus suffered and died on the cross for all of us. The story I want to tell you today is called The Tale of the Three Trees. A tale is a story that's been told many times before. This is about three trees whose wishes come true but in different and surprising ways. Once upon a mountain top, three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The first little tree looked up at the stars twinkling like diamonds above him. I want to hold treasure, he said. I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I will be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be a strong sailing ship, he said. I want to travel mighty waters and carry powerful kings. I will be the strongest ship in the world. The third little tree looked down into the valley below where busy men and busy women looked in, worked in a busy town. I don't want to leave this mountaintop at all, she said. I want to grow so tall 
that when people stop to look at me, they will raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I will be the tallest tree in the world. Years passed. The rains came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, This tree is beautiful. It is perfect for me. With a swoop of his shining axe, the first tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful chest, thought the first tree. I shall hold wonderful treasure. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, This tree is strong. It is perfect for me. With a swoop of his shining axe, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be a strong ship fit for kings. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter looked her way. She stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven. But the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. With a swoop of his shining axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought him to a carpenter shop. But the busy carpenter was not thinking about treasure chests. Instead, his work-worn hands fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals. The once beautiful tree was not covered with gold or filled with treasure. He was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took him to a shipyard. But no mighty sailing ships were being made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. Too small and too weak to sail an ocean or even a river, he was taken to a little lake. Every day he brought in loads of dead, smelly fish. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter cut her into strong beams and left her in a lumber yard. What happened? The once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted to do was stay on the mountaintop and point to God. Many, many days and nights passed. The three trees nearly forgot their dreams. But one night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby in the feed box. I wish I could make a cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, she said. And suddenly, the first tree knew he was holding the greatest treasure in the world. One evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into the old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out into the lake. Soon, a thundering and thrashing storm arose. The little tree shuddered. He knew he did not have the strength to carry so many passengers safely through the wind and rain. The tired man awakened. He stood up, stretched out his hand and said, peace. The storm stopped as quickly as it had begun. And suddenly the second tree knew he was carrying the king of heaven and earth. One Friday morning, the third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the forgotten woodpile. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when soldiers nailed a man's hands to her. She felt ugly and harsh and cruel. But on Sunday morning, when the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It had made the first tree beautiful. 
it had made the second tree strong. And every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. That was better than being the tallest tree in the world. The three trees all had a dream of what they wanted to be or do when they grew up, but God had a special plan for each one of them, and it turned out better than they could have imagined. God has a plan for each one of you, too. If you accept him into your life and believe that he died for you, he will show you what he wants you to do for him. Let's thank him for dying on the cross for us. Dear Jesus, thank you for suffering and dying on the cross for all of us. Thank you that if we believe in you and live for you, you will do wonderful things in our lives. Thank you for loving us. Amen. Shalom, everyone on Facebook. My name is Pastor Harold Espinosa, and I work at the Winkler Berteller Mennonite Church, and I'm also the ministry director here at the bunker. As you and I know, life has changed, but Jesus Christ has not changed. So what we're doing is something pretty special right here for everybody in Winkler and beyond. And anywhere in my Facebook where it goes, that would be so cool. On Easter Sunday, which is April the 12th, at 10 in the morning, on Facebook Live, on my Facebook page, we're going to do something special for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be singing, we're going to be worshiping and praising the Lord Jesus Christ of everything he has done for us. And we want to invite you to join me on my Facebook page on April the 12th. A group of people that are going to be getting together following the Manitoba Health and Safety Rules 100% to worship Jesus Christ and what he has done. So, I invite you. The Bible says in Isaiah 41, 13, For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. And this is what we're going to be doing that day. We're going to be worshiping Jesus Christ. And I, and I encourage you to join me April the 12th, 10 in the morning, on my Facebook page, and share it with your friends, Jesus he is alive. Thank you so much.
Good morning, Victor Engbrecht here, and uh, this morning we're going to have a scripture reading from the book of Isaiah, and it's going to tie into my sermon. I'm going, to, I'm going to be looking at how Christ is presented as Savior, or how God works out his salvation, and uh, I'm going to look at three stories, one from Genesis, one from Exodus, and one from Leviticus, and uh, the prophet Isaiah ties these all together. <clears throat> So reading from Isaiah, I'm going to read a few verses in chapter 52 and then continue in chapter 53. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations. He grew up like, before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him 
to suffer. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. At this time, Pastor Victor is going to be coming and sharing with us the morning message. Well, again, good morning, Winkler Berktaller. Bringing you a message this Good Friday in the year of the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope you're all faring well as we continue to isolate ourselves, willingly or otherwise. I said to Eileen that surely this will make for some stronger marriages because it's going to require a lot of us to work uh, to make it together. Maybe it's helpful that we live in the north. We're somewhat used to isolating ourselves in the wintertime. Anyway, greetings from our home to yours. May God bless us as we spend this time together. How do you begin a Good Friday message in a year like this? <clears throat> in January, just three months ago, we heard of some kind of new disease that was making some people in China ill. We noticed that this sickness was gradually spreading. Soon we heard that this was a viral Ill illness that was making its way around China. And eventually it became clear that this virus, the coronavirus, had become a real concern. And it was posing a serious threat. The disease caused by the coronavirus was named COVID-19. And in the last two months, this disease, as we like to say, has gone viral, pun intended. Because the virus is so very contagious, it spread quickly around the globe, and there is now almost no country in the world that has not been touched. This scenario has produced some interesting theories. Some say it was a natural process, and others say it was engineered. Among those who say it was engineered, some say that it was accidental, and others say that it was intentional. Still others say that it was a byproduct of some other intentional endeavors. However the coronavirus came about, it has produced a variety of responses around the globe. Some people don't think that this virus is all that serious, while others have come, become quite anxious and fearful. Those who react fearfully have taken to some drastic measures, like hoarding toilet paper, of all things. But supplies of all kinds have been exhausted from store shelves. The healthcare sector is finding itself short of a number of necessary devices and supplies. And governments have directed the industrial sector to churn out more of these necessities. As governments around the world attempt to make good decisions, they are relying on the information they receive from medical professionals and from the scientific community. In their efforts to combat the spread of the disease, they have declared states of emergency, setting guidelines and putting new laws in place. Increasingly, these new measures are being enforced with hefty fines and prison terms. Air travel has been brought to a standstill. Crossing borders is prohibited and many businesses have been ordered to close. All this activity, <clears throat> sorry, as all this activity is being reported around the world, people are wondering about the unknown. What will happen with the future? There is real and genuine concern. But aside from all the fearful guesswork, this situation has changed how we live. Stay home is one of the most common instructions we hear on the news, and so we do. But this has produced some undesirable consequences. Many of us are getting cabin fever, tired of being isolated. We're also getting lonely. We're eager to see our friends and family again. Seniors and shut-ins in our town don't get as many visits as they used to. The people at Salem don't get any visits at all from their loved ones. The staff at Salem have more work to do because the families that tend to the residents are not allowed to be there. Social services are more difficult to access. Grocery shopping is more challenging, while a lot of other shopping has been stopped altogether. Some businesses are forced to close 
while other businesses have the advantage of being declared essential services. But working environments have had to be altered in order to accommodate the distance rule. Families cannot gather to support the dying or each other. People who die from COVID-19 often have to die alone. People who have to bury the dead do so without the presence and the support of the wider community. In lieu of gatherings, we make online church services like this one. <clears throat> we talk and sing and preach to a camera or we watch the service on a screen. It's all so distant and antiseptic. These are things we are not used to and they make life a real challenge. Yet, technology and other things help us to bridge those gaps that exist between us. As we have become more isolated, we have also become more motivated to address our challenges. We are physically alone, but we have access to devices that make connections possible. We have phones. We still have phones. And we can talk with our phones, on our phones, to our children and grandchildren. At Salem Home, someone introduced the idea of using iPads to connect uh, residents with their families. Eileen and I use FaceTime to connect with our children and grandchildren. <clears throat> People who need help from a variety of social services can do so by phone or computer. We've developed order and delivery systems for groceries, healthcare, schooling, etc. And people are coming up with new ideas every day, with or without technology. What I find remarkable is that there is essentially one story in the news, and it is the same story the world over. The whole world is focused on one thing, and most people in the world are doing the same thing. How often has that happened in world history? <clears throat> Another thing that I find remarkable is the extent to which so many people are willing to go to avoid the coronavirus. Think about it. Everyone on this planet seems willing to avoid this plague. Not only willing, but keen. No one seems to be rebelling against government's order, government orders that attempt to contain the spread of the virus. That might change soon, but so far, it seems, we're happy to comply. Eileen and I started reading Jeremiah recently. And it is again apparent to me that apart from God's intervention, Apart from God's initiative, we are all on the road to destruction. God tells us how he sees us. Genesis 6 verse 5 says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And in Jeremiah 17 verse 6, God says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. What do you do with something that is beyond cure? People with the most serious cases of COVID-19 are beyond cure. The last time I looked at worldwide statistics, nearly 82,000 people have died from the disease and another 48,000 are in critical condition many of them beyond cure. Of those who contract COVID-19, world statistics show that about 80% recover and 20% die. That means of the current number of cases, which stands at about 1.4 million today, about 400,000 people will die from this disease. So why am I saying this? <clears throat> I'm not saying this to make us fearful or to make us overwhelmed, but I want to make a realistic comparison to another condition that is actually quite a bit more serious. There's another global pandemic that has the world in its grip, and the end results of this one are staggering. It is the pandemic of sin. No one escapes this disease. In fact, everyone is born with it. And everyone who is diseased by sin is beyond cure. 
Because everyone who gets the disease dies. Everyone has it, everyone is beyond cure, and everyone will die. But God. Without God in the picture, that is how it looks. Complete ruin for all mankind, but God, the great physician, he has the treatment. He has the power not only to put sin, the sin disease, into remission, but to eradicate it completely forever. How does he do that? How does God save us from a disease that permeates the whole human race with such devastating results? Let's find out. The problem for us is that the disease is not physical, it is spiritual. Man has come a long way with science and medicine and the treatment of the physical human body. Man has even made a little progress with mental illness. But man is lost when it comes to spiritual illness. For that there is only one solution. The solution is a man and his name is Jesus Christ. So how does God apply a solution to our spiritual problem? The sin that I commit in the physical realm is evidence of my spiritual condition. Does that make sense? I'll say it again. The sin that I commit in the physical realm is evidence of my spiritual condition. Similarly, God's solution for sin is worked out in the physical realm and then applied to my spiritual condition. What does this look like? And where do we see it? Scripture gives us a few pictures of how God works salvation for man. And I want to share a few of these. One is found in Genesis 22, the substitute. We find the account of Abraham where God commands him to take his long promised son, his only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him as an offering to the Lord. This was a test for Abraham's obedience. But when God saw that Abraham passed the test, God stopped him from following through with the sacrifice. God spared Isaac and provided a ram as a substitute for him. This is a picture of God's salvation. He provides a substitute. Another one is the Passover. <clears throat> if you look in Exodus chapter 12, you will see this story. And here we have another picture of God's salvation. Israel had been in bondage in Egypt for 400 years when God heard their cry and took action. The children of Israel were powerless to, to save themselves, so God sent Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt, and he used Moses to speak to Pharaoh to persuade him to let Israel go. God supplied Moses with marvelous signs to convince Pharaoh to cooperate. Nine devastating plagues swept through Egypt before negotiations between Moses and Pharaoh broke down. There was one plague left, which finally convinced Pharaoh to let Israel go. It was the plague of death of all the firstborn in Egypt. Not even Israel was exempt from this plague. But just before this last plague is where God established the Passover as a symbol or a sign of his deliverance. <clears throat> I'm going to read a few verses from Exodus chapter 12, starting at verse 3. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of each month, of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for his house, each, one for each household. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, 
and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. The night of that first Passover meal, the angel of death went throughout Egypt, taking the life of all the firstborn. But in the homes where the blood of the lamb was applied to the door frames, the angel of death did not enter, but passed over. There was no death in Israel that night. And that day, the whole nation of Israel walked out of Egypt, and they were freed from their captors. God delivered them from the plague of death and from captivity in Egypt. The Passover meal was the sign for their deliverance. <clears throat> the Day of Atonement is another picture. And this one we find in Leviticus chapter 16. So we've seen God's salvation by substitution. We've seen God's salvation by deliverance. And in Leviticus 16, we have this picture of God's salvation. This is where we find the ceremony of the Day of Atonement. Atonement means reconciliation. The Day of Atonement is when the sins of all Israel were removed. This was the only day on which the High Priest was to enter the Holy of Holies in the Tabernacle. It was an annual event in which the High Priest would first offer a bull as a sin offering for himself and his house. And then he would take the blood of the bull and enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant to make atonement for it. Next, he would take two goats. One was to be sacrificed as a sin offering for the sins of the people of Israel. The blood from this goat was also sprinkled on, in the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat to make atonement for it, and on the tent of meeting to make atonement for it, and on the altar to make atonement for it, because the tabernacle was in the midst of an unclean people. Let me read what happens next. When Aaron, the high priest, was finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed to the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. The Day of Atonement represents a double picture of salvation. <clears throat> the first goat is sacrificed for the sins of the people, and the second goat takes away the sins of the people. And what does that do? Removing sin reconciles us to God. Without sin standing between us, our, rec our relationship with God is reconciled. So 1,100 years later, as Israel is again heading for captivity because of her sins, the prophet Isaiah brings these three pictures together, the substitution, the deliverance from captivity, and the removal of sin. And Isaiah 52 and 53 foretell of this salvation of God to come. He's brought them all together. And after this service, I would encourage you to read those two chapters and see if you can find where each one of those is mentioned in the story. Now, 700 years after Isaiah, John the Baptist is the one who said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So what is the meaning of all this? <clears throat> it tells me that God has had it in mind to save men from their sin for a long time. In fact, we find evidence of God's plan of salvation already in Genesis chapter 3. And God's salvation is so effective that it completely heals the sin-sick soul so that it will never again become sick. In the story of Abraham and Isaac, God provided a substitute offering. It was a substitute for Isaac, Abraham's only son. On the cross, 
God provided his only son as a substitute for us. Jesus died in our place. In the ritual of the Passover, a man slaughters an unblemished lamb as a remembrance of God's deliverance. And it was the blood of the lamb that delivered them from death. On the cross, Jesus secured our deliverance. And it is the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, that delivers us from death. On the Day of Atonement, two goats were slaughtered, sorry, selected. One was slaughtered and sacrificed for the sins of the people, and the other took away the sins of the people. And again, on the cross, God undertook the removal of sin. Jesus sacrificed his life for the sins of all men, and on him the sins of the world were taken away. Jesus is our substitute, our deliverer, our sin offering, and our scapegoat. Nothing, is, nothing more is required, and nothing is left undone. Jesus' death and resurrection is sufficient for the salvation of all who believe. Hebrews 12 verse 9 says, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Therefore, we rejoice and give thanks for the salvation of our God. We live in a time when the future looks uncertain. The whole world seems more than willing to do what they're told in order to avoid the coronavirus. Imagine if we were all just as determined to avoid the contamination of sin. But even then, the, infe uh, the infection is so deep and the disease of sin so gripping, all our efforts to avoid it would not erase our need for a savior. The COVID-19 pandemic pales in comparison to the sin pandemic. We might be able to avoid COVID-19, but no one can avoid being ravaged by sin. The solution to the sin pandemic is Jesus Christ. We need a savior because none of us is without sin and because all of us are sinful by nature. We need a savior to deliver us from death. We need a savior in the courts of heaven to be our advocate, to stand in for us, to take our place. And we need a savior who will remove from us the stain of sin, to make us righteous and reconcile us to the Father. Jesus has done all these things. Hallowed be his name. If you are walking with the Lord, Praise him, because his salvation is sure. If you need to return to him, come home today. He's waiting for you. And if you haven't put your faith in Jesus yet, do it today. Don't let COVID-19 distract you from seeing the real threat on your life. To die from COVID-19 is only a physical death. To die from unbelief is an eternal death. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 say this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. That he is our substitute, he has died in our place. And that it is his blood that delivers us from death. And that his life was sacrificed for the sins of the people. And that on him all our sins were laid and he has taken them all away. Father, we, rem we remember those 
who are battling the COVID-19 pandemic. Many people are suffering. There are many who are critical. And there are many who will not live. Father, we pray for their souls, that they will see the light of the gospel and hear your word and live. But Father, we also pray for the whole world, which is in the grips of sin. And so we pray, Father, that you would grant salvation, that you would pour out your spirit, that many would hear the gospel and confess Jesus as Lord and live. Father, I thank you that you have given us your word, that you have told us what is true so that we can believe. Would you go with us now as we go into the world and, uh, and live out what we believe to be true, your word. And now, Father, I pray this blessing on our people. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you this day, this Good Friday. Oh, my.